Those of you that have been following along with the process of making a small batch of wine will know that we've taken it from the paddock, we've picked it carefully, we've processed it, and now we're at the third video stage. This video is about taking your wine from the pot into the tank and all the steps in between. Buckle up, it should be fun. If you do like this video, please don't forget, hit the little subscribe button down there, give it a thumbs up, you've got no idea how much that helps the channel. Alrighty, let's get started. Ah, now, that's a better smell. It's been about 24 hours now since the pick and I'm starting to get the first aromas of wine coming out of this ferment. Let's plunge it and then I'll show you how I do a temp and bome, which I do every single day to manage the ferment to make sure I get the right flavours at the end. The first thing I'm doing is I'm working the cap back down into the ferment um, because as you can see there are bubbles of gas coming up and those bubbles of gas push the fruit to the top of the ferment causing it to dry out, you can get bacterial growth, but more importantly, you're not getting the extraction of the colours and the flavours out of the skins if they're sitting on top of the wine. You want them inside the wine. So the first thing we're doing, going to do every time we visit, twice a day, is give this ferment a little bit of a plunge. Very easy to do at the moment because the ferment's only just started. The cap will start to harden up in a couple of days time. It'll get really crusty um, and you'll get a clear separation between juice and skins. At the moment it's still quite mixed in together but it's good practice to start right from the beginning. Now for the next step we need a large measuring cylinder. We're going to put that into the ferment covering the end with a couple of fingers just leaving small gaps so that you don't get heaps and heaps of skins in the juice and we'll fill that up. Okay now that we've got a nice measuring cylinder full of juice we're going to put our thermometer into the ferment, then we're going to get our hydrometer. Now hydrometer is kind of like a boat that floats in the ocean. It's got a lead weight at the bottom and it's a sealed cylinder of very thin glass. What you want to do is you want to spin the hydrometer as you drop it into the juice and then let it sit and stabilise and it's got a set of gradients on the side that tells you how much sugar is left in the ferment. Now the reason why this works is because sugar adds density to the liquid. So as the sugar leaves the liquid, as it becomes carbon dioxide and alcohol, the density of the liquid will decrease until a zero point for juice. You can get these for beer and all sorts of things. This one's specifically done for wine. And we're sitting on 12 and a half today. So we started out this morning on a just over 13. We've lost half a Bome in a day. That's fantastic. I'm well expecting that by tomorrow morning, that will be down to about 11 and a half. And the temperature will be rising. Now the reason why the temperature rises is because as the yeast metabolizes the sugar, it's gone up to 20 degrees from 18 this morning. As the yeast metabolizes the sugar, it creates heat energy, just like the heat energy that comes out of you when you metabolize sugar. All right, so we're gonna write those numbers down very carefully on our board, keep a track of the ferment. It's really, really critical at this stage that you just monitor your temperature and your loss of sugar over time. If the loss of sugar is going too quick, cool the ferment down. If it's not going fast enough, heat it up, create some more heat, just like you, yeast works better the hotter it gets. So this is pretty much the next six to seven days of just working the cap, checking the temps and bomes, keeping a record of it, and making sure that everything goes well with the ferment. Good morning. In fact, it's good morning two days later. Let's find out how the ferment's going. First, we'll give this a good plunge. We'll push down the cap. Then we'll do a temp and bome and see after a couple of days how much progress the wine's made. I'm just using a shovel push the cap down and hopefully you can see that beautiful crust just breaking up as we push the shovel in and that amazing frothing liquid that's going to become that beautiful wine starting to develop. All right, let's get pushing. So 
So we'll fill up our measuring cylinder, a couple of fingers over the end to stop all the berries going in. Now of course we get our hydrometer and we drop that into the wine and find out where our sugar's at. And yes, it is dropping. I mean, I could have told you that anyway, the way it's bubbling away. Eight and a half. So she's gone down a bit overnight. Not necessarily a terrible problem. Let's just see what the temperature is and make sure that's not spiking. So of course, put the thermometer in the brew. I'll go away and wash these, come back, check the thermometer, and we'll record our values. Now we pull our thermometer out, and you can see she's sitting on about 20 degrees. Perfect. Okay, so we can see now with the dates that we're slowly losing sugar on the left here, and we're maintaining a reasonably steady temperature. We had a slightly larger drop here, but as I said, that's right in the middle of ferment. That's to be expected. It's not a perfect science, it's an art. So we'll just keep trying to measure this, keep the temperature reasonably stable and keep that drop to around about one degree Bome drop a day. And that way we'll preserve our beautiful delicate flavors as we make the rest of our wine. And that's the job done for this morning. Good night, and we'll see you in a few days time. The wine's down to its last half a degree of sugar. It's a really exciting stage. This is where we add our last secret ingredient, a little bit of malobacter. We're gonna put malobacter or malic acid eating bacteria into the pot of wine. It's gonna then start to convert the malic acid, which tastes like harsh apple cores, into softer lactic acid, which is found in milk and gives it its creamy flavor. For home winemakers, it's a must to add malic bacteria right at the end of your ferment. It's gonna soften out your wine, take away those harsh characteristics and make it a lot more palatable for the drinkers. So it's really important to remember that you should not press off your wine until it's dry. It'll still be releasing carbon dioxide for several days, so you've got a nice blanket of protective carbon dioxide over the juice while you press. And you can see that we've been keeping careful records. And we're now down to the day where we press the wine. Let's go do it. So before we start pressing, it's a really good idea to get rid of the free run juice because this is super sloppy and there's a lot of juice in here. It'd get really messy if we try and put it all into the press. So the first thing I've done is I've made up a little basket filter by drilling holes into a plastic bucket. That can then be placed into the skins. It stops the skins from entering, but allows the juice to run in. Then what I can do from this bucket, I can fill a container and prime my pump. Now, if you don't have a pump, I would thoroughly recommend getting one. They're only about a hundred odd dollars um, and they'll make your job an awful lot easier when it comes time to pressing out your fruit. Now that we've got our pump primed, put our suction hose down into the basket filter and pump away. Now you'll start to pump your free run juice up into the tank before you begin the pressing process. This will take a few minutes. Of course, the bucket as a strainer hack is a little bit cheap and cheerful, but if it's gonna save you a few bucks and do the same thing as a store-bought item, why wouldn't you? So now it's time to start shoveling our grape skins into the press and retrieve as much juice as we can. Before we do that, we have to set the press up. So let's have a look at that. The press is made up of wooden staves held together by metal bands and it comes apart in two halves. I've done the other side up already. The sides are held together with these little pins that form cam locks. You simply put them in 
and hold them into place. These guys are ingenious and they're going to be really important in pulling the press apart when we put a lot of pressure on the skins later on. So now let's line up some buckets underneath the press, start shoveling in our grape skins and start pressing. To begin with, just a light pressure with your hands, pressing down on it is enough to make the juice run quite freely out of the press and really fill your bucket quickly. After a short period of time though, just your hands aren't enough to get all of the juice out of all of those berries. So this is where we start to put the top plates on top of the press. put our chuck on the top and start winding down to press it. So who says playing blocks didn't teach you anything when you were a kid? That was your first step to becoming a winemaker. Now the dolly is an interesting tool. It's simply a circle of holes that's rotated around metal teeth that are removable. If I spin them this way, they tighten up. If I spin them that way, they let loose. So make sure that we've got them in the tightening position before we get going, they oppose each other. Then we start cranking the handle and away we go tightening it up. Next up, while supporting the head, you've got to twist this around and start putting some real good pressure on those skins. Now we'll start to get some free run. Don't forget, check your free run. The worst thing in the world is putting all this effort in to have the juice go everywhere because you forgot to change a bucket. Bottles and bottles of wine. Okay, a little bit of time has elapsed. Now we've got the press so tight that there's barely any, any run of juice and this head's got really far down into the stave. So I've only got a small amount of skins left. What I do to release it is spin these teeth around, give it a few backward spins, let the pressure off. Once the pressure's off, I can then spin this out of the way, releasing all pressure. The juice stops completely running. I pull this, wind this up high enough so that it's out of the way. And this is where my can locks come in beautifully. All I have to do is release them with fingertip pressure and the whole thing falls apart. And in there, ladies and gentlemen, is the cake. Now, of course, this is not like any old cake. It's a bit dry, it's a little bit tough. Still tastes good. It will compost, but it's highly acidic, and I certainly wouldn't go feeding it to stock because it's got a lot of alcohol in it. When you press white skins off free run juice before, uh, before you ferment, that's a really good stock feed. You've just got to be careful, of course, it's still quite acidic and it's full of sugar. You don't want to give them too much, but it is a really good fattening feed. The red stuff though, after it's been fermented, really what you want to do is you want to compost it for a good 12 months and then it's great under the garden.
Now that we've dealt with the cake, all we have to do is clean all the equipment spotlessly, make sure that there's no acid in that that's going to rust it over the next 12 months, make sure bacteria can't get a foothold for next year's brew. Then I'm going to show you how to put the lid on the ferment, because remember it's still going through Malo, it's still going to produce CO2, so we need a trick to stop our tank from leaking. Let me clean this up and I'll show you the tank trick. So now we're at the last step. We have to put a lid on the tank that we've just transferred our wine into so that it can sit for a couple of weeks and all the dead yeast called the lees can settle out of the clean wine. So we need to be able to seal it off from the air but still allow carbon dioxide to come out because remember, it's going through Malo. So what we're going to do is we're going to use a variable capacity lid on our tank. It's got a seal around the outside that blows up like a bicycle inner tube that's made out of food grade rubber. And it's got a hole in the top that we can put a bubbler in to allow the CO2 to come out, but not let the air get in. Let's set up our lid and put our wine to bed. Next up is our bubbler, and you'll notice that I've filled it with water. It's a tube inside a tube design. Then what I do is I put a little cap over the top that doesn't allow oxygen to get in because it's sealed off by the water, but it allows the CO2 to push it up and bubble its way out. In case things get too enthusiastic overnight, we've also got a cap that we can put on top just to seal things up. Now our lid is set up and ready to put in place. Now using my special safety stool, all I have to do is lower the lid into the tank until it's about two centimetres off the top of the wine. I want to leave a little bit of headspace in case there's some expansion. Now that my lid is secured about a centimetre off the top of the wine, all I have to do is pump my gauge up so it's at the top of the green, seal it off so it doesn't leak, and then make sure I come back and check that gauge tomorrow and the next day and the next day because these things can leak and if they do, bye bye wine. Anyone with a basic recipe kit and the right equipment can make wine, but it takes years and years and years of practice and a lot of skill and a lot of art to make great wine. And I suppose that's why I love winemaking so much. It doesn't matter how good the wine you made this year is, you can always do better. I hope you liked this video. If you did, make sure you hit the subscribe button. Give us, a th give us a thumbs up. It really helps out the channel. And I'll see you next time with something else new. Bye now. Now, of course, this is not like any old cake. It's a bit dry. It's a little bit tough. Still tastes good. Nah, only kidding, it's horrible.